Greetings, gentle viewers. Today, I would like to especially thank one Perry Roberts for his selection of today's reviewed anime via supporting me on Patreon. He is a gentleman and a scholar, and you would not be watching this right now were it not for him. Thank you, Perry. Now, on with the show. You ever notice how when you watch or read something from a fantasy setting, you notice that it has certain similarities between other stories that you may have read? Like there is a baseline of how the worlds themselves function, the fundamentals that you don't need to have explained to you every time. Maybe magic is in this universe, and if it is, you accept it. You don't ask how or why, you're just like, oh, there's magic. And suddenly all of your knowledge of magic from all these different fantasy settings and worlds fill in the gaps of magic in this new world. At least the gaps that are not directly explained. It's rare to find stories, at least popular stories, that take place in a universe wherein the structure of culture is so different that it requires its own rather lengthy explanation. When I do find these stories, however, I'm usually rather torn. I like the fact that I get to experience something new, something completely different from the norm, because new things can be amazing if you let them. But I also become worried because it's very hard to find the right balance between explanation and plot. Front load all the explanation of the setting and you might have some viewers that are really bored. Don't explain anything, however, and instead they are lost and confused. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada, and welcome to Glass Reflection Today, a 50-episode series from Studio Periot that takes place in a fantasy world with many unfamiliar events and rules. Today I give you Tegami Bachi, Letter B, and also its second season, Reversal. Let's jam. In the world of Tegamibachi, there are many a strange thing. First and foremost, there is no sun. The vast majority of the world is in perpetual darkness, save for the inner capital city lit by an enormous artificial sun, which its inner workings are shrouded in a haze of lies and intrigue. Cities in this world are few and far between, becoming ever less likely the farther away from the capital you get. And the barren wastelands between them are all home to monstrous bug-like creatures referred to as Gaichu. Besides being virtually imperishable by traditional weaponry, they also have the ability to feed off the hearts of unlikely and unfortunate victims, leaving them emotionless zombies without memories, if they survive at all. The focus, however, is on a specific set of government workers known as Tegamibachi, or Letter Bs, postmen and women who traverse the country from town to town delivering letters. Aided by either a loyal animal or mercenary referred to as a dingo, the Tegamibachi are able to combat the Gaichu with weapons that deliver powerful pieces of the user's heart straight into the Gaichu, causing them to explode. Quite simply, they kill them with the power of heart. Take that, Captain Planet Haters. So we have a 50 episode series about a guy that... roams around delivering letters? Because when you put it that way, it's not very interesting, is it? Thankfully, of course, it is so much more than just that. The show takes a very metaphorical look on the actions of delivering letters, saying that the letters themselves are more than just words on a piece of parchment. Instead, they are like pieces of the sender's heart, sent to loved ones far away where travel is not really recommended. So in reality, while a very large chunk of episodes are devoted to the delivering of letters, that's more of a means to an end, the end being the individual stories of the inhabitants of the world. It's similar, I think, to how the series Mushi Shi structures its episodes around the existence of ghosts like Mushi and their interactions with people. The biggest difference, of course, between Mushi Shi and Tegumibachi is the existence of a rather large, overarching storyline. The real meat of the show is the journey of the show's main character, Lag Seeing, and his development from a package of sorts to a full-fledged Letter B. A defender, as it were, of people's hearts against the anti-government organization, Reverse. 
I suppose one of the problems I had with it is just how drawn out everything is. This series is 50 episodes. 50. 5 zero. Season 1 is split half and half between Lag's journey to actually become a Tagamibachi, a letter B in English, and a bunch of standalone episodes about all the people that he is delivering letters to, while Season 2 is a lot more about the overarching plot against Reverse. And yes, I have to say, Reverse! In that way. It's not the same when you do it anyway else. Now, as much as I enjoyed the standalone episodes, I always got this feeling that they were just sort of stalling for time. In some ways, hyping up the overarching plot, but taking forever to show it. Like George R.R. R. Martin saying that winter is coming. Because, you know, it's coming. Sure, if the payoff was good enough, the somewhat slog through the other episodes would have been well worth the effort, but... Shall we say, the conclusion of the overarching plot leaves a lot to be desired. While they spend good amounts of time on certain aspects to get them nice and fleshed out, which I applaud them greatly, other aspects are left wide open with little to no satisfying conclusion to them. The biggest, of course, being the lack of any sort of criticism towards REVERSE's actual goals. The organization of REVERSE that the Tegumibachi actually go up against is very much like, say, Greenpeace if it was run by murderers. There's never any evidence given that what REVERSE is fighting for is necessarily wrong, but instead we're just focusing on their actions, which themselves are rather deplorable. Let me explain it with a hypothetical situation. Let's say that the government has been killing a bunch of kittens. REVERSE is fighting to save the kittens, but they do so by killing the government's family. The focus is put on the murder of the family, while completely ignoring that the government may or may not, in fact, be actually killing kittens. Of course, Reverse is the only people that actually have told us that the government are killing kittens, so they could be lying. But no one ever bothers to, you know, actually go and check. And that right there, I think, is bar none the biggest criticism I have against this show. For as much time as it has, 50 episodes for those who happened to forget, there is so much that is left unexplained at the end of the day. The journey through the show is rather enjoyable, but for me, I think I enjoyed it because I spent the whole time with this assumption that a lot of the questions I had were going to be answered by the end, and while several of them were, there were plenty that were not. For a show that spends more than a few episodes on the individual stories of people's hearts, the characters are thankfully one of the show's stronger points. Even if some of the characters could very easily fit into tropes that we've seen used countless times. Hell, one could say that the entire show is just one big analogy for Joseph Campbell's monomyth, but not a perfect one, to be sure. Lag seeing our main character is the one who gets the most development, to be sure. After this first several episodes of prologue, which, by the way, the show has a prologue, that's kind of cool. Lag's main goal is to eventually become a letter B, like the man who delivered him from his wreck of a home after his mother left slash was kidnapped slash abandoned him or something that was not apparently as important as anything else. He has this image of what he eventually wants to become, and that image is what gets constantly challenged throughout the show. His motivations are rather straightforward once you realize that. You could say that it makes his character rather simplistic, but honestly, I don't think he needed to be complex, as that would just take away from the stories of the secondary characters that the show is attempting to tell. Not to say that he doesn't have his own little quirks, the average letter B's weapon contains some magical amber that allows it to function properly against a gaichu. Lag's gun has no such amber. Instead, he has a fake left eye that itself is just entirely made up of that same kind of amber, which gives him some extra magical powers, as it were, to see into the hearts and memories of others, which is something that happens <clears throat> quite often. At Lag's side is his dingo, Nietzsche, half girl, half something else, with incredible agility, strength, and indestructible hair that can morph into plenty of different shapes. She accompanies Lag because he was the first to actually treat her as a person, rather than just a thing to be gawked at. Her personality, however, can be rather jarring at times. Very much a character made up of tons of soon with little to no daddy, if you know what I mean. She's short-tempered and really stubborn. However, while she may not have always had the best kind of common sense, her loyalty to Lag is really unparalleled in this series. It's loyalty without being attached to an unnecessary romantic subplot, which I very much appreciate. Beyond those two, there are a myriad of characters that become 
reoccurring characters, from Lag's fellow Letter Bs to their commanding officers, as well as various townspeople that they interact with on a regular basis. But, of course, the most important of any of these that I will finish off with is the character of Gosho Suedo. Suede is the one who delivers Lag in the prologue, and is the person who Lag has constructed his image of the perfect Tegamibachi after. However, beyond the prologue, it takes quite a bit of time until we ever see Suede again, as we are informed that he just disappeared one day shortly after being transferred to the country's capital. The actual disappearance of Suede is not something that ever gets fully explained. We just know that it happens and are forced to accept it and move on, which is not something I ever agreed with. And that, of course, ties back into the whole bunch of things never get explained that I mentioned previously. And there are many, many other things that are left unexplained about Swade's character, leaving him more like a MacGuffin for lag rather than an actual character in his own right. More than likely, though, this is all followed up in the original material, as usual, leaving anime watchers shit out of luck. The animation for the series is kind of a mixed bag of sorts. The character designs are great, and a lot of the backgrounds of locations and cities are beautiful, but this only really comes into play when there's not a lot of movement. To be fair though, the show has plenty of monologuing, not to say that that's a bad thing, but the downsides in the animation are usually when more action is in play, especially when the gaichu are involved. The gaichu themselves are 3D rendered monstrosities, and for the most part, I do not say that kindly. They're an example of 3D just glaring horribly with 2D animation. It's just a bit too much CGI, to be honest. Not as bad as, say, Fate Stay Night's Dragon, but whatever. To their credit, when killed, the Gaiju's explosions do look extremely cool. The music did a wonderful job of creating and maintaining the show's atmosphere. It has excellent use of different instruments that give the show a more classical feel, while also having some rather chilling moments and upbeat ones when need be. And I've said before that I love strings, in music, especially in conjunction with piano, and... Well, there's a lot of that. The one major downside I've thought of, though some might not actually consider it as such, is just how little music there actually is. For a 50 episode series, the OST has a little over 20 individual tracks. As such, there was a lot of repetition throughout the show. Now, you could just say that that helps keep everything unified throughout the two seasons, but at the same time, I just kind of wish there was more, you know? <laughs> After further research into why the show did what it did in regards to several plot threads not being perfectly tied up, I discovered something that I had actually suspected. Apparently, at some point during the production of the show, the creators had caught up to the manga, and were then told that no, the show is stopping at 50 episodes. Perhaps because maybe they thought it was actually going to go beyond that at some point which left them with a couple of options. One, creating an entire season of filler, which obviously did not happen, or as actually happened, to have the show deviate from the manga and to do so in a way that ties up more plot threads than it would have if they just continued and ended. Now, to be clear, I am not one of those kind of people that believe that automatically deviating from the manga makes a show horrible. The manga as great as it may or may not be, is not the be-all and end-all. An anime should be able to stand on its own. But in this case... It didn't do as well as I thought it could. Now that being said, I can't say that it wasn't fun to watch, because it was. But with how everything ended up, I question if it actually had to be 50 episodes. Like, it could have been less. But of course, while we're just sitting here fantasizing, I could also ask why those 50 episodes weren't tightened up a bit more to give a more cohesive story overall. Well, I guess when you plan for some things at the start, and then things change over the course of developments, you just gotta go with what you get, I suppose. Granted, however, there were several points in the show where they just kind of retconned scenes that they showed previously in flashback moments by having the dialogue be different. And when I look at things like that, I just think, well, technically, anything should have been possible. It just wasn't for whatever reason. But with everything in mind, I have meticulously calculated values for the categories of story, characters, animation, sound, and my own personal enjoyment, which after applying the proper postage, putting that in a box, putting that box in another box, shipping that box to myself, and smashing it with a hammer! As me awarding Tegamibachi Letter B with an overall score of 7 out of 10 and a recommendation to stream it rather than buy. 
As good as some might find it, 50 episodes was a bit much for what we got, and translating that into DVD terms means that things start to get expensive fast. It's much better to just watch it legally online if you can, and then see if you think it's worth the purchase for you. Speaking of, at the time of this video, you can watch Tegami Bachi on Crunchyroll, and if you click on the link in the description, glassreflection.net slash Crunchyroll, you can sign up for a free trial of Crunchyroll's premium services and all the anime awesomeness that it contains. Of course, full disclosure, you do not need to be a premium member in order to watch Letter B. And if you enjoy the series so much, however, that you need to buy it, it has been licensed and is available from Sentai Filmworks in North America, split among four DVD sets at present that encompass both seasons. Not badly priced for the amount of episodes you get, but considering it is indeed 50 episodes, it might be a bit much for most people. For alternate anime recommendations, I point you towards a show called Shigofumi, where the common relation between it and Tegami Bachi is the delivering of letters. Except in Shigofumi's case, it's letters from the dead. Also recommended is Last Exile, with characters who sort of serve the same function, but do so in other ways before getting involved in a save the world kind of plot. That involves CGI that is done a hell of a lot better than Tagami Bachi, like you don't even know. Seriously. Between those two, you should hopefully find something to your liking. And that's it for me. Please subscribe for more videos, follow me on Twitter if you feel so inclined, and hey, if you like what I do here and feel like helping out, please consider going down and checking out my Patreon page and possibly signing up for a monthly donation. A very special thanks to Nick Fritsch, Owen Morse, and Gary Perbrick for donating already. You guys are amazing. <laughs>